I'm Erin Miley O'Keefe, and this is Lisa Kuhneman, and we also have another cohort, Betsy Hall, who's around. And uh, I guess it was maybe five months ago, we said, we were, I was holding little tiny house talks in my house, and Betsy said, we should do a festival. And I was like, I don't know, I'm building a tiny house this year. That's like, seems kind of crazy. And then she said it again. And then the third time she said it, I was like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> and here we are. So thanks for turning out. Um, Lisa wanted me to remind you about is on the Indiegogo site, we're, we're crowdfunding this festival, um, a house that myself and many generous hands, including my husband, we, in the last six days, we built that, the paper boat house, which is the SIP house over there. And that's gonna be done this fall. And if you wanna stay in it in May of next year, um, you can go on the Indiegogo site. You know more about that. You wanna say a little bit about that? Sure. Um, there are one night opportunities and two night opportunities to stay in Miley House. There are some images that if you haven't already gone over, I think they're, already, they're posted over there as well. You can take a look at what the finished um, house is gonna look like. I don't think you've seen anything else out there like it. Uh, if you've seen a lot of tiny houses, this one's definitely unique. Um, so, you know, it's a great opportunity because once uh, Aaron and Kevin move in, I think that opportunity will be gone. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks for coming yeah. and making it what it is. Yeah. So, yeah, and like Lisa said, this festival is really about integrating into downtown Brattleboro. So we're really encouraging also the restaurants throughout Brattleboro of have Tiny Bites menus, which is why we don't have food vendors here. So please, if you're not from Brattleboro or you are from Brattleboro, set, Take a walk through the town and uh, and support our local businesses. Next up, we have solar options, solar solutions, um, with Joseph Mangum and Glenn Letourneau. Did I say it right? Okay, Letourneau. I'm going to give it away to them. They're from Integrated Solar and Sunnyside Solar Store. All right, all right. Enough of that. We don't have much time. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Uh, we were supposed to start a little bit early. We're a little behind. So, um, uh, uh, thank you, Aaron. Um, so, as Aaron said, uh, my name is Glenn Letourneau. I work for Integrated Solar. This is uh, Joseph Mangum. He is the owner of the Sunnyside Solar Store here in Brattleboro. And we're going to try to rush through really quick this PowerPoint and uh, give you some ideas for options for solar on tiny houses. Uh, some of you in here, this is probably going to be very, very simple for you um, if you know anything about solar. If you don't, it'll just be kind of a fun ride on the different possibilities that you can do. So um, <clears throat> getting right into it, uh, this first picture I have here, I just put this in here because uh, this is the ultimate solar tiny house. 100% of it is actually made from solar energy. So. Um, uh, I thought that was kind of cute. But anyway, um, Joe, if you could go to the next slide, that'd be great. Okay, so first thing I wanted to get into uh, for you folks is um, tiny houses are often done by people who are wanting to build their own house. It's a sort of a small DIY project, but it's still going to be one of the biggest projects that you undertake in your life if you build one yourself. And of the whole project, you need to get everything right, but electricity is the thing that you need to get the most right because uh, if you don't, you'll see in a coming up slide why that can be a bad thing. But uh, so what I want to say is seek professional assistance. If you're not a licensed electrician or you're not very competent with electricity, even the small, tiny 12-volt systems can be dangerous, can cause fires. You don't want that to happen. And you don't know what you don't know until you ask someone. So um, always follow the NEC and electrical best practices. Always use proper protective equipment when building your solar tiny house and um, the right tool for the job. Always look for UL, ETL, CSA listed materials because you know those have been tested for safety and for functionality. And um, don't cut corners and don't rush. You'll regret it later on. Okay. Um, so yes, don't, please don't let this happen to your tiny house. It would be very sad. It would be a ruining of a lot of work and money that you put into something. Uh, okay, so the first option for you tiny house dwellers is 
what are called direct drive systems. So what this is, is this is basically you have a solar panel that attaches directly to the load it serves. So in this case, this is an attic fan, and so the, the brighter the sun shines, the hotter your attic or your tiny house or your space is going to be, and the faster that fan is going to spin because the solar is producing more power to spin that fan faster. Alternately, uh, solar water pumps, if you have a fixed tiny house and you're attached to a utility grid that has, you know, if you have town water or, or a well, then you might choose to also add solar hot water, which we're not really talking about, but a great um, thing to have is a solar panel attached to a solar hot water pump because, again, the hotter it gets, the more solar energy you're creating on your solar hot water panel and that pump will circulate it and exchange the heat into your hot water tank faster. Um, and it doesn't take anything out of your batteries if you're in an off-grid system. So that's uh, a good e efficiency improvement. Um, pros and cons of direct drive systems. Um, no apparent efficiency losses because the solar is tied directly to the load, so you don't have to worry about anything like that. Uh, you don't need anything but the PV and the load. Uh, it's very simple to install. Uh, most of these systems are 12 volts, and so is not much of a shock hazard for you. And yeah, just really easy. And they don't cost that much up front usually. Um, downside is, of course, because solar is powering the load, only works in the daytime, only works when you have good solar. So it gets hot in your tiny house and you're using that to ventilate the space and it's cloudy, that's not going to work so well. Um, you can only run simple loads. Uh, replacements, if you buy, that, say, that um, solar attic fan and it breaks in five years, which it probably won't, but if it does, good luck trying to find the same fan or similar size thing. So that's, that's another con. Um, and yeah, again, no ability to work at night or to mitigate effects of shade. So, uh, Option two, much better option, a <clears throat> little more complicated, a little more expensive, but uh, DC only system. So what you have here is you have some solar panels and those go to a charge controller, which keeps your batteries from overcharging, which can happen if you don't have a charge controller. And that goes to your batteries, and then you have DC loads. So basically, if you've ever used an RV, there's probably been some DC loads in there. And just like in a car where you have the cigarette lighter jack, um, anything that has that little cigarette lighter plug end, you can plug into there, and it's a 12 volt load that you can use. And so if you go to the next slide, Joe, you'll see some of the things that you can use. So pretty much anything within reason that you want to use, you could do in your tiny house. You can have a little hot plate, LED lights, coffee maker. Down in the corner is a combined MP3 CD player, DVD player, and you can even get 12 volt TVs. So it doesn't have to be Spartan living if you're doing a 12 volt only system. And for some tiny house systems in particular, in particularly the traveling tiny homes, this could be a good option. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, so pros and cons of DC only. So uh, pro is it's a greater, if greater efficient system than as we get further on, you'll see the next system is going to have solar inverter. So you're still not as efficient as going directly to the load because you have to go through a charge controller and into batteries, which that path of electricity flow is going to, uh, you're going to have some power losses. But it's still very reasonable. It's still relatively inexpensive because you don't have the solar inverter and other associated equipment, which usually are about a third of the cost of the system. Um, still relatively safe and easy to install. We're still most likely talking about only 12 volt systems. And um, so fewer parts and pieces to fail. This is very important, especially if you're traveling on the road. Um, downsides are you can't power a typical load. So if you go and you pick up something uh, from the store or somebody comes to visit you, you can't run any typical AC load because you only have that DC. Um, also, those little hot pots and the coffee makers and TVs and things like that that are set up for 12 volts, those are probably going to be more expensive off the shelf just because they don't have the economy of scale that your typical, you know, 
12 pot coffee maker that you could pick up at Walmart or Brown and Roberts or whatever it would, would be. So they're probably going to cost you more. Um, another issue with DC only systems is if you have a fixed tiny house or s small house and you want to wire the whole thing in 12 volts DC, if you're going to go far with your wiring, you're going to have some significant uh, voltage drops. So you may have to use larger wiring, so it might be a little bit more expensive in that realm. Um, so another con is you can't easily pair a generator because generators produce alternating current. Um, and the and reason, if, go the ahead. reason why you'd use a generator is batteries, of course, run down, and so it's just a backup system if you don't have shade. And if you go to the next slide, <laughs> which you pro tip. To get around the issue of not being able to power your incidental AC loads, you can get one of these little Honda suitcase generators, which are totally awesome and they're super quiet and they're small, so it's easy to store, especially if you have a mobile tiny house. And um, if you just want a tiny little incidental thing that doesn't use a lot of power, you can get one of these little plug-in uh, 12 volt to 120, what I'm calling a microinverter, which I don't confuse that with an actual microinverter, that's just me being silly. Um, so, option three, and we have five options by the way. Uh, option three, this is where you get into much more complex systems and much more costly. But these systems, now you're starting to look at being able to run things like you would in a typical house. This particular system, which is probably hard to see in this light, but you have, uh, you have a solar inverter, and that solar inverter, you have a charge controller, so your solar comes in, goes through a series of breakers, comes to the charge controller, comes back through a series of breakers, goes out through this conduit you probably can't see, and goes to a battery bank, and then the inverter draws power from that battery bank, converts it from DC to AC, and this particular unit is about 6,500 watts in, you know, continuous, which is a fair amount of power. Um, this actually, the system here is installed in Guilford in a, one of the customers of the company I work for, Integrated Solar. And um, they run a whole regular normal house. Um, they have refrigerators, chest freezers, much to my chagrin, um, <laughs> and things like that that uh, typically we don't advise people to do off grid. But it's been working great for them for, I don't know, five or six years now. So um, yeah, especially if you have a fixed tiny house where you're going to be in one location and not moving. A bigger unit like this might be a good fit for you, um, and there's always the ability to connect to an actual larger generator with this unit. So, especially in the wintertime, if you're off grid and you're not producing enough solar energy, you can still keep your batteries charged and run loads like um, dryer or other things that, again, we don't want you to run in off grid systems, but people do anyway. Um, so, yeah, so that's. Um, Option three. So how this works, again, is you have your solar panel over here. It goes through a charge controller, goes to the battery bank. Then that power goes to the inverter, either comes out to your loads, and it can be connected to the utility grid if you're fixed in place and you have the ability to backfeed. And so any excess energy that you produce in the summertime, because in an off-grid system, you're going to design your solar system for your worst producing time of the year, which is winter. So in the summer, you'll kind of overproduce. But in the summer, when you're overproducing, you can actually sell that power back to the utility. And um, you know it'll make the financial investment better. <clears throat> OK, so pros and cons of these systems are now you can use pretty much anything that you can imagine that you would use in a regular house. Um, you can easily tie the generator in. AC equipment, relatively available, cheap. You can go over to Walmart, go to Brown and Roberts, go to True Value. You can pick up a coffee pot, a hot pot, whatever it is that you want to you run, and you can just plug it into a regular standard AC wall outlet. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. Longer runs, smaller wire. Um, you don't have the voltage drop issue that you'd have with the DC only 12 volt system. So, um, that's, trust me, that's a good thing when you're talking about the cost of your system. Uh, let's see, and of course you can sell excess power if your tiny house is in a fixed location. So cons, less efficient than a DC only system, so your typical battery based 
uh, but grid capable inverter only has an efficiency of somewhere in the low 80s to the low 90s for percentage wise. So in addition to the power that you lose going through your wires, through your charge controller, in and out of your batteries, now you have an inverter which takes another uh, toll on efficiency and then so you're probably ending up with an entire system efficiency in the 70% range. And since your solar panels on the roof are probably harvesting anywhere from 12 to 20% of the sunlight that's hitting them, that can be a big deal. Um, but still, in my opinion, this is the best system if you can go this route. Uh, so let's see, other cons. Uh, it's the most expensive system other than a uh, hybrid system, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, more complex and dangerous. Typically, with these kind of systems, now you're dealing with 120 volt AC electricity coming from the wall, so it's not that simple 12 volt that's not going to shock you unless you're in some really strange position that you, you know, it'd be hard for the guys from Mythbusters to recreate. Um, and of course, there's more parts and pieces to fail, so every time you add complexity, you're adding more parts and pieces that can and eventually will fail on you. So this is just a pictograph I got off the internet of how that works. Solar on the roof goes down to your charge control, or yeah, it goes down to your charge controller, to your inverter, to your battery, or to your batteries, then to your inverter, and then out to your loads, or again, if you're grid tied, out to the grid. Uh, oh, that was grid tie only, my bad. I was like, there's no batteries, but... <laughs> My bad. I'm trying to breeze through this too quickly. So grid tie only, there would be no batteries. It would go directly from your solar on the roof to your inverter, and then either to the loads in your house or back out to the utility. Um, this is a good thing, again, if your tiny house is in a fixed location. If you have the utility grid, pros and cons, I know it's on there. The pro is you have the grid. A lot of people who want to do off-grid systems or want to do tiny houses, want to do so because they kind of want to, they have this glorified idea that I'm going to stick it to the utility, take the, you know, take the power and produce all of the energy myself. It's a great concept, but especially if you've been living on the grid your whole life, once you get out there off-grid, you'll find it's a lot more complicated than you thought it was, and it's, it's really nice to have the grid available to you. Um, so, uh, let's see, let's run through this here. Pro, cheaper than battery-based systems, batteries alone, a typical battery-based system can cost you several thousand dollars, depends on how much you need, but you're probably looking at anywhere from two to eight thousand dollars for a battery bank. Um, fewer parts to fail with a grid tie only system, um, batteries typically last between that uh, depends, between five and 15 years. You can get some that'll last longer, some that won't last as long. It really depends on how much you cycle them, depends, which it means how, mu how much, how often you take them from being fully charged down to a certain depth of discharge to usually about 80%. Um, so, um, you know, it's really hard to say how long an individual bank of batteries will last you if you're really cautious with them. 10 to 12 years I find is about average. Um, some people will kill a battery bank in two or three years. Some people have them for 20. So, um, But there's also different technologies of batteries. I mean, this is true. you're talking more lead acid, but there's other kinds that are out there that have longer, they have longevity and um, less maintenance. And I mean, it's just variable. It really is ultimately going to depend upon the, uh, it's going to depend on how hard, how heavy you cycle them and how often. So. Um, but Joe's right, there are other kinds of batteries out there that, you know, some batteries will last longer than others. Um, all right, that's fine. <laughs> oh, three minutes, okay, all right, so we'll breeze through this. All right, so a hybrid system, this is the last option that we have. This is easily the most complex, easily the most expensive system you can get because what this allows you to do is to have more than one generation source. So this, in this picture here, you have a wind turbine and a PV array. This would be considered a hybrid system. And the great thing about solar and wind paired together is that solar produces really well in the daytime and especially in the late spring, summer, and early fall. And wind creates an opposite curve, works better at night, and works best in the early spring, uh, winter, and late fall. So um, they, they work really well together in that regard. Uh, pros and cons, 
Now you're not just relying on one source. Again, works, wind can work 24-7 if you're in the right location, although Vermont is not the right location. Um, <laughs> pro, everyone will think that you're so cool and green um, because you have more than one generation system. Uh, cons, again, most complex, most parts to fail, and they will, especially the wind machine. Um, and um, yeah, let's just skip that. So. Joe didn't want me to put this in here, I put it in here anyway. Some reputable manufacturers of solar equipment that I have used over the years and I have found these, these people to be relatively reliable. Some of these will work for some of the options we've explained and some of them won't work for some of the options we've explained. So you'll have to you know, do some research on your own or come see Joe or myself at the booth to see you know, what would it take to get you in a solar system and That's what system is right for you. And to clarify, the reason why I didn't want Glenn to put these up right away is that people will come in and they say, I've heard of this product, I really want it, it's really good, but it has nothing to do with the application that they're doing. And that's the only thing, just to clarify. It's it is true. <laughs> it is true. Um, so always look for these logos. So when you're buying equipment, whether it's the solar panels, whether it's the battery charger, inverter, anything, you especially want to be looking for this one in the middle, the underwriters laboratory UL listed. Um, this is what the logo will look like. The C in the U.S. is just, that's this particular item would have been listed for the U.S. and Canada. Um, CSA, Canadian Standards Association, just because it says that, we'll take questions afterwards outside. I'm sorry, I don't really have enough time, but um, those, you can use those products in America too. Um, they'll, CSA also will say U.S. on the side, like the UL, I just didn't get a picture of that. And ETL, Edison Testing Laboratories, um, carries about the same weight as UL. So any of these, you probably got a good product. Um, here's some recommended reading. If you're going to build a tiny house, do your own wiring. Uh, these are three books that I think would be beneficial for you. Um, solar Electric House by Steve Strong, who I consider the godfather of solar. He, his, his book, um, that's going to give you more of the theory of solar. Um, so, you know, I just think it's a really great book. The one in the middle in particular, Photovoltaic Design and Installation Manual from Solar Energy International out in uh, Paonia, Colorado. That is the one book that you all should, if you take anything out of this presentation, buy that book. Yes. Buy that book, not because SEI is awesome, but because it has everything that you need to at least design your system so that it's proper. I can't tell you that you're going to install it right from reading this book, but I can tell you that you'll at least get the design right. Uh, and the last book is just to help you understand the rest of the non-solar wiring, but as it applies to solar energy, um, which is my whole book. Um, sources. So we put these on here um, just so nobody would sue me if I took their image from the internet and didn't give them credit. Um, although most of the things I, are my own and, and I have permission to use them. Um, I guess that was the end of it. So uh, thank you very much. Once again, sorry we got off to a late start.